Good morning to you. I greet you in a name that is more powerful than any other name. The name of Jesus. Aren't you glad you know him? I have to throw this in. My daughter had a baby this week. Any grandparents out there just had to throw that in? <clears throat> Actually, her fourth, and she says her final. But uh, they named him Malcolm. My son-in-law lived in Scotland when he was in high school and uh, fell in love with Scotland. And they named him Malcolm because the first, I think it's three kings of Scotland were named Malcolm. And so uh, they named him Malcolm. And usually when we pick a name, there's some type of connection. There's some type of relationship that comes from uh, somewhere, you know, my name is Jimmy Charles. My, my grandpa, my great grandpa was Jimmy and my dad's favorite cousin was Charles and Jimmy Charles. Nothing profound about it. Uh, they just kind of, they didn't go on a three-day fast to pick it, obviously. They just picked a name. But the Bible says the father gave him, Jesus, a name that is above every other name. He is the wonderful counselor, prince of peace, the mighty God. He's the everlasting father. And how many of you are glad he's your Lord and Savior? Can you give him just one more shout of praise? The name of Jesus, the name above every other name. I'm honored to be here with you today. I thank you, Pastor John, Pastor Terry, for this opportunity to be with this wonderful church. I tell you, I've thought this when I was here before, and I felt it again the first service. If I lived within 50 miles of here, I can tell you where I would go to church. It would be right here. Uh, I, I love this worship team. Uh, bless you guys. You know, they're talented musicians, but... You know, a lot of people can play instruments. I'm not one of them, but a lot of people can. But they are talented, but they are anointed. They, they have it surrendered to God, and they bring us into the presence of God. Aren't you grateful for them today? I, I know you probably think of that a lot. Don't take it for granted. Don't take it for granted. And I'll tell you another thing. You have some of the most dynamic leaders as your pastors of anybody I know on this planet. I haven't been everywhere, but I've been in many nations around the world, and I've traveled over 30 years. There's no finer leaders and pastors than your pastors, Pastor John and Terry. And I'm grateful to you guys for how you impart uh, to me and Pam. He brought a dynamic word to our church last week, actually. Um, it's okay if I tell this. I, I'm going to tell it anyway. I may never be back. Nice knowing y'all, but... <clears throat> When he called me and asked me to come and, and speak, he said, can you come on the 20th? And I said, no, because my daughter's due on the 21st, and I'm not missing it. And uh, so I said, but I t he said, how about the 27th? And I said, yeah, if you'll come to Austin on the 27th, because I said, I don't want to preach. My son-in-law don't want to preach. That baby's due the next day. And then lo and behold, uh, he didn't show up by the 21st. But Pastor John came and brought a great word, and so the baby didn't come. He was late, and so I called Pastor John. I said, look, if he's not here by Saturday, I ain't coming. Guess what? I ain't coming. But he came, and everybody's healthy and happy. But your pastor brought a dynamic word to our church, and I'm just grateful for how you, you sharpen me, my brother. And... Help me stay on track. Everybody have a Bible, a cell phone, iPad, some? Most of you don't have any of these, do you? You know, I'm old school. You see, what? so turn in your phone if you want to turn in your phone or wherever you want to turn to. The book of Ephesians chapter number four. I'd like to speak to you from three verses. Ephesians chapter number four, if you would allow me to, please. Verse four says, there's one body and there's one spirit. Just as you were called in one hope of your calling, there was one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism, there's one God and Father of all. I want you to catch this part. Who is this God, this one God? He is above all, He is through all, and He is in you all. I want to speak to you this morning about the power of one, and I want you to pray with me before I, 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 I start. You know, I believe when you come to church, church uh, is a place of connection. It's a place in this atmosphere where you can connect with God, that God wants to connect with you. He said, where two or more gather in my name, I am there. The God that created this universe, the God of all splendor and wonder, is right here in this room because we're gathered in his name and we're exalting him. And he wants to connect with us wherever we're at. Another thing that I believe church is, I believe church is a place of conversation, I believe it's a place where God wants to speak to you, and some people that makes you nervous, but it shouldn't make you nervous because He's a loving God, and He wants to speak to us. Now, I know that whoever's bringing the message, God speaks through that. He speaks through His Word, and we pray that God uses us to speak His Word, and there's a general Word that He'll speak to us, but I believe beyond that, God wants to take His Word and speak specifically, directly to you something that you can live with to make your life better. And I'm going to ask you this morning to pray, God, speak to me. As I listen to the Word, speak to me as I speak to you about the power of one. Would you pray with me, please, across this room? Father, we thank you today for your Word. The Bible tells us that the Word of God is alive. It's a living document. 
And you breathe the Word of God into life, and you're breathing the Word now. And I pray each person that has come today into this worship service that you let this be a place of conversation where you can speak to them and they take something from this place today that makes their life better through the power of your Word, I pray. And help me in my feeble way, God, to speak. You're the teacher, Holy Spirit. Teach us today, I pray, in Jesus' name. And everybody that agrees with that, would you say amen? Amen. I have this month been preaching through the book of Genesis, or in the book of Genesis, you can't preach through, you can stay there for three years actually, there's so many <laughs> dynamic stories there. In fact, uh, when, when you look at some of the things that are there, I started off with a, a message about Noah and how God, uh, his timing and, and, and all of the things that were related to that story, and then I went over to Jacob, and you, you get to all these stories in the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, and I basically just started January 1 reading Genesis, and then I ended up just preaching out of Uh, of what I had read. And and as you read, you see that these people were flawed people. They were not perfect people, even the father of our faith, Abraham. You see that, you know, when he was in in the promised land, God brought him to, that he left there and he went to Egypt. There was a famine. God didn't call him to Egypt necessarily. He went there because of a famine. And while he was there, he lied about his wife. You say, Abraham lied. Yeah, he he lied about his wife. And he he went before uh, the people there uh, in a way that Uh, It kind of upset them that he had lied, but all the while God blessed his life and prospered him, came out of Egypt basically (laughs) even more wealthy. And the Bible shows us that he picked up a young lady as a handmaid there named Hagar, an Egyptian handmaid, and and she went with them and became a, a servant girl to his wife. And Sarah had Hagar for, with her for years, and God gave promise to Abraham that he would have a son. And they get old, and they don't have a son. And they're real old, and they don't have a son. And finally, Sarah says to Abraham, well, why don't you just take this Egyptian girl we brought and just, just sleep with her? Who does that? I mean, I can tell you my wife don't think that way. <laughs> Who does that? Just, just, just have a baby with her. I can't have one. Why don't you just take her and sleep with her? I mean, like... Who does that kind of stuff? I just want you to see that these people in here, they were flawed. And all that was, was a human attempt to bring to pass God's promise. God had given the promise of a son. They jumped ahead of God in their own uh, scheming and planning. And and really the world's still fighting over it. The sons of uh, Ishmael and Isaac are still fighting because of what happened back then. And I'm simply saying that when you read these stories, you have to realize these are flawed people, but they were followers. In fact, if you think you've got family problems, you ought to just read the book of Genesis this month. And I'll tell you, the time you get to the end of the book of Genesis, you'll look at your wife and say, Alice, we're not so bad after all. I mean, look at what all is in this book, and this is the Bible. They were flawed, but they were followers. They have this connection with God. That's what makes this worship team so great. Yeah, they're talented, but you can sense that that there's this going on. And the Bible says that there is one God, and He is in you and through you all. And there's power in every one of you that God wants to operate through. You have giftings, you have talents, you have abilities. Everybody does. We also have grace giftings that, that we're to develop spiritually. They're all given to us by God. But the fact is God wants to work through all. And so I'm speaking to you today about the power of one. And as I talk about some of these Old Testament stories, understand that there's always New Testament application. Basically, your Bible is two covenants, an old covenant and a new covenant. Hebrews tells us that when Jesus came, he simply brought us a new and a better covenant. Doesn't mean that the old is, you, know, you never read it, you don't have anything to do with it. It means Jesus came and he fulfilled it and he brought us more. For example, he changed the priesthood. They used to have to kill rams and goats and all this stuff to atone for sin. How many glad you don't have to kill anything because he's already died for you and the blood has been shed? There was always an application of these stories in the New Testament. I'll give you an example. Preaching through Genesis, I saw the story of Jacob. Jacob, who became Israel, he had an encounter one night with God at a place called Bethel, formerly called Luz, named it Bethel. And there God and he had an encounter and he saw a ladder going up and down and the angel of God ascending and descending. I think it's Genesis 28, somewhere through there. And he has this dream and it's about what's going to happen in his life. New Testament application. You can go to John chapter 1. Jesus came and he said, I think it's verse 51. He said, I'm the staircase. I'm the way. If you want to get to God, I am the way. How many of you are glad when you could not get to God, he loved you so much, he came down to our level. We couldn't get to him, God came to us through Jesus Christ. So all through the scripture, we see this. 
but yet there is one God. So I'm, I'm saying all that to say this. Still yet to this day, perhaps the most profound statement to me in all the book of Genesis is the first words, and most of you know what it is. In the beginning, God. <laughs> and everything else came from there. He was before all things, in the beginning, God. One God. There's one God, one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one hope, one calling. He's in you all, and He's through you all. So I have three things that I want you to walk out of here with, but I hope one you can apply. The first one is, there is power in one. Every one, there's power in one. When you are aligned with God, again, no matter how flawed you may feel like your life has been, if you look and see some of these flawed individuals, as long as you keep your heart turned to God, there's power in God as long as you keep this going on between you and God. When you look in the Scriptures, there's a billion examples, it seems like. I picked one in the first service. It's kind of hard to unpack the story, but if you just let me just real quickly, the story of Gideon, it's in the book of Judges. And it's chapter 6 and 7, basically. The story is simply this. I'm talking about the power of one. This time in Israel, they're under attack by a vast horde of adversaries. The Amalekites, the Midianites, the Bible talks about a massive number of enemies. I mean, like everything's mounted against them. And it's to the point that they're captivated. Even these people are coming in and destroying their crops. They don't have enough food to eat. It's a desperate situation. And we pick up a story in the book of Judges, the sixth chapter at the 11th verse. And here's what it says. It says, now the angel of the Lord, and this is actually the Lord himself, came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizarite, while he, his son Gideon threshed, you notice I skipped right on by the pronunciations of those names, but <clears throat> his son Gideon, I can pronounce that one, threshed wheat in the wine press. You don't thresh wheat in a wine press. You stomp grapes in a wine press. Why was he threshing wheat in a wine press? Because they were destroying their crops. All this guy Gideon's trying to do, basically, if I can put it plainly, is to make a cornbread living for his family. That's all he's trying to do. And so he's got his hands on some wheat, and to keep the enemy from taking his goods, he takes the wheat into a wine press where the enemy won't be looking for him because it's not grape harvest season, and he's just simply trying to thresh his wheat and get something to eat, and all of a sudden God shows up. Isn't it amazing how God can do sometime when you least expect him, boom, there he is. Some of you need to expect him right now. And so here he is in this wine press. He's threshing out, uh, threshing out this wheat, and the angel of the Lord appears to him and says to him, the Lord is with you. Now, remember, these are beat down, beat up, defeated people. He said, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. The Lord says he's a man of valor, and all he is is some boy trying, trying to make a cornbread living, beating out some wheat. And God says, you're a mighty man of valor, because the Lord was with him. And so Gideon said to him, oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why then has all this happened to us? If the Lord is with us, where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about? I've heard it all, but he's saying, I haven't seen it. And he said, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt, but now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of Midian, of the Midianites. And that's a fine response to a man that just called you a mighty man of valor, isn't it? Like if he's God, where in the world is he? You see, God's not thrown off by your game. He understands that we're flawed, we're fallible. He understands that. It doesn't throw God off his game. God says to him, go in the might, this might of yours, catch this, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites, have I not sent you. Notice, God did not say, I will deliver the Israelites from the Midianites. He said, you go in this power of yours, in other words, it's God that is with you, and you will do it. Faith is always an action. God is always looking for a person. Everybody in this church is important to the mission and the vision of this church. Everybody has power. There is power in one. Turn to your neighbor and say, you got power you know not of. You know, you can make a difference where you don't know you can make a difference. Now, this is what's kind of hard to unpack. I don't have to do this real quickly, but if you were to read this story, it goes on, and Gideon, he thinks, man, and God does some phenomenal stuff. I mean, they, he puts a sacrifice out, and God causes fire to come out of the rock and to consume the sacrifice. Now, I've never seen anything like that personally, but man, like, wow, okay, God. And then you read on in the story, and God says, well, that's, that's, Gideon says, I mean, Gideon says, that's really cool, God, but said, you know, I'm, I'm just, are you sure? 
He said, tell you what, God, tonight could you do this? I'm going to take this piece of fleece and I'm going to lay it out here on this wine press floor. And when the dew falls tonight, would you cause the dew to fall only on this and no dew anywhere else? He gets up the next morning and guess what? Ringing wet here, nothing there. Well, that's cool, God, but you know what, God, I'm still not sure. Could you do it in reverse tonight, God? This is in the Bible. I'm not making this up. Y'all looking at me like I'm on some wacko show. This is in the Bible. And God does the same thing the next night. <laughs> Nothing on the fleece, do everywhere else. <laughs> and then he's still like, okay, God, are you sure? And so God said, assemble the men. So 32,000 men. Now, this is not nearly as many as the enemy has. 32,000 show up. And God says, that's too many. He said, ask him who's afraid. He said, any of y'all afraid? 22,000, raise their hand. God said, send them home. I don't want the afraidy cats. 22,000, go home. Now he's got 10,000. God says, it's still too many. This is all in the Bible. You got 10,000. God said, it's still too many. He said, take them down to the water to get a drink. He said, take only the men that lap the water with their hand. Like those guys that just stick their head in there and go like that. You don't want them. Only 300 do it like this. The rest of them stuck their head in the water. God said, send the 9,700 home, keep the 300, give them all a pitcher, and put a candle in it, and go stand out there among the enemy. And when I tell you, break the pitcher and shout, and you'll rout the Midianites. Now, how many thinks that sounds like a ridiculous plan? <laughs> but if you want to read it in your Bible, read it when you get home. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't read it now. Stay awake and listen to him. But read it when you get home, and they rout the Midianites. Why? Because one man was aligned with God who thought he was nothing, who, th who thought God wasn't anywhere around, like, where is this God anyway? And when he got aligned with God, said, God said, I'm going to show you what I can do. I'm saying to somebody this morning, I don't know what's going on in your life, but if you'll keep that heart turned toward God, I don't care how flawed you are. I don't care how much you have doubted in the past. There is one God that is able, he is able, he is able, he is able. There is power in one. You say, what difference can I make? Let me tell you the story of a little lady named Lenora. 30-some years ago, my wife and I, <clears throat> we actually have been married over 40 years. I know it doesn't look like it, but if you go back and look on the uh, cover of People magazine, we were on there as, as the first three-year-olds to ever get married in America. We were on that back <laughs> about 40 years ago. But she, <clears throat> she my wife, was in her mid-20s, had our first baby. Within a few months, was gravely ill, began to get ill. And she had an illness for four years that doctors, for almost four years, could not find. For at least three years, couldn't even find what it was. And it got to the point, it was, it was, it was really taking a toll on her body. And what would happen was, it would hit her cyclically. And so for three years, they thought it was all female-related, but it found out later it was a blood disorder. And nobody could find it because they were on the wrong track because this disease is not very common in America. My wife is Sicilian. She is of Sicilian descent. And she, uh, so just be nice to me. Her uncle Luigi likes me very well. Just want you to know that. But anyway, she's, she's Sicilian. And this disease is common among people in the Mediterranean world, but it's not known here in America very well. And finally, after four years, a, a Christian spirit-filled doctor discovered it. I can remember the day he walked in our hospital room and said to us, to Pam, he said, "Hun, he said, I've got good news for you and I've got some bad news. He said, the good news is we've discovered what's wrong. What? We've been on the wrong track. It's in your blood. He called the name of this weird disease. And your blood cycles every so many weeks. And when those cycles would hit, when she'd get so sick. And he said, and the bad news is there is no cure. And what the disease would do to her, the sickness would do, she, she would start feeling better. When her blood would cycle, she would get just she, in excruciating pain. I'd see her at times laying in the floor, not wanting to live, in such pain. She'd get where she couldn't keep food down, then she'd get where she couldn't keep a sip of water down. So she had been in different hospitals, different doctors, and when this cycle would hit, sometimes they'd have to put her in the hospital, rehydrate her dehydrated body, and it was taking her toll over these three to four years. After about almost four years, I think it was, is when this doctor discovered this. Well, toward the end of all of this going on, my wife was very ill. One day, we're home, just she and I, and she's very ill, and I knew that if God didn't touch her, she's going to be back in the hospital within 24 hours. And she's laying on the couch. Doorbell rings. I go to the door, and it's a lady named Lenora. My wife is part of a Bible study there at that time in our hometown. And Lenora said, hello. She said, I came to see if I could just visit with Pam a little bit today. Well, Pam really wasn't in the mood to entertain anybody. I said, well, she feels pretty rough, but go ahead and come in for a minute if you want to. And she came in, and she sat down on the couch, and I went to the kitchen. And, and our living family room, was the kitchen was right here with an opening, and you went around. And so I went on in the kitchen and piddled around, and... And I, I hear the conversation. 
And this lady's talking to Pam, and she says this. She said, Pam, and we've prayed every prayer we know to pray. People all over this country praying for her. She didn't have a prayer line you can think of. We were standing in faith doing everything we knew to do. But yet she continued to get worse. And this lady talks just a little bit, and she says this, and I hear her quote a scripture. It's Exodus 23, 25. She says, Pam, the Lord gave me a scripture to bring to you, and I just want to share this with you. It says in Exodus 23, 25, I'll bless your bread and water and take sickness from the midst of you. I'll bless what you eat and drink and take sickness from the midst. Now, you've got two choices. You can listen to that and say, hey, my wife can't even sip water. How dare you say something about food and water? Or you can say, well, that is in the Bible, and I'm going to believe the promise of God. I'm in the kitchen, and I heard that scripture, and I don't know why. Again, I can't do the theology. Ask Pastor John. He's smarter than me. He'll tell you next week. But today, I don't know the theology on it. All I know is this. We would prayed every verse we knew to pray, every prayer we knew to pray. But that day, when I heard that verse, it became rhema. It became alive to me that this is what God promised us in his word. And I said, God, I believe that. That is your word. I'm going to stand on the, on the word of God. And I concocted a, a plan that I was going to do as soon as Lenora left. I could not wait on her to leave. I think she stayed six weeks. I don't know how long she was there. I wanted her to leave because as soon as she walked out the door, I had opened up a can of Campbell's chicken noodle soup. That is the limit of my cooking ability. But I can read. I dumped it in a bowl. I put it in the microwave. And while that microwave's running, I was confessing Exodus 23, 25 to the bowl, to the spoon, to the broth, to the noodles, to the chicken or whatever it is they call chicken in there. And I was saying that. And then when I got done, I carried it into my wife. And she can't sip water and keep it down. I said, baby, I know you don't feel like eating. But I said, that woman shared that scripture. I said, something went off on the inside of me. I believe this is God's promise and God's word. Would you try to eat some of this soup? And she sat up in her weakened state and picked up that spoon and began to eat. And all I can tell you is every noodle that went down stayed down. And sitting in Austin, Texas this morning is a woman that has been healed for over 30 years. (laughs) Glory to God for that. But I really told you that story for a different reason. There's power in one. I don't know why God chose to manifest himself that way. But God used one woman and one verse. And do you know, now this is a test, how many times she visited my wife in four years? I bet you can't guess. You got it. You won. One time, one promise, one woman, one visit, one time, one God, and a woman is healed by the power of God. You came too late to tell me there's not power in one. I love the story Pastor Ricky told you about that little child. You know, if we old folks won't do it, the kids will. You know what I'm talking about? There's power in one. There's also power in oneness when a bunch of people become one. That's why this church is so powerful. Your power is in your unity. God sent you one leader with a vision. The vision didn't come from him. It came from God. He's a faithful steward of it to disseminate it. And all of you, as one team, have locked arms like this and say, devil, watch out in the valley. Why? Because there's one God. We have one vision. There's power in oneness. Here's what the psalmist said in Psalm 133, verse 1. The King James says, behold how good and pleasant it is for brothers, for people to dwell together in unity. Behold. Look at that word behold. And that's the King James. The New King James has that. Different translations say different things. But I studied this. And did you know that they say the word that is there in the original, we don't have a good English word for it, that behold is not a very good word for it. They say really the closest thing that we have to that today would be the word wow. That wow. People are unified. That God stands back and says, well, think about it. One God. But yet we read on in the scripture, he also had a son, Jesus. One God, but okay, we we got Jesus and he's God and the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but one God, right? But how many of you, that's a little hard to understand on the surface, right? On the surface, it is. Do you have to think about how they feel? Jesus said, I came to point you to the Father. He said, the Spirit will draw you to the Father. They function as one. They're different entities, but they function as one. You don't have to understand it to accept it. You have to accept it by faith. I don't understand everything. I don't understand my wife. I'm never going to understand my wife, but I sure love her. I don't understand God, but I sure love him. I don't understand how black cows eat green grass and give yellow milk and white butter, but somehow white milk and yellow butter, but somehow they do. 
you throw a tortilla out at me with some butter. I'm not going to sit there and look at that and say, I wonder if that would be good on there. Baby, I'm going to slap it on there and swallow it whole. You know why? Because I've already tasted it and I know it's good. The Bible says, just taste and see that the Lord is good. In other words, just give God a little chance, just a little taste and see that the Lord is good. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. You see, they're all locked. They've all locked arms. You know this will help your marriage if you're under attack. You may not think alike, but stay unified. Don't let ever don't ever let anything take the unity out of the church. This little clip. You ever see the movie Gladiator? Hallmark Christmas movie. Y'all saw it, right? <clears throat> it's not a chick flick. I want to show a clip, and I, I'll, I'll go to the last point, and we'll be done because this will tell you all the power of. Here's here's the setup. If you haven't seen it, Russell Crowe. He's the actor. He's taken captive by Rome. The sadistic Roman emperor gets all these gladiators out there in the arena, and they're outnumbered. It's so they can get killed in front of them. And they're outnumbered, and you see they got all these chariots come out, and they're going to wipe them out. And Russell Crowe and his little band are going to be wiped out. But something happens, and the enemy gets the table turned on him. There's one key to it. Watch this. Looking bad right here. That's one. I'm mean, glad there's power when you stay united together with God. And as a body together, there is power in unity. Jesus talked about, I'm not going to read in John chapter 17. Let me go to the number three. Power in one, power in oneness, and there's power in one thing. The one thing Lenora did, there was power in it. That one person doing one thing, there's power in one thing. You know, when you come to church and I tell our church, just, I just get one thing out of this. Right. One thing out of this. It doesn't do any good to come together. Eh, I enjoyed that today. What can I take and make a difference in my life? What will help me have a better week this week than I had last week? And sometimes it's just one thing. And so as I wrap this up this morning, I want you to do something with me. I want to say, God, is there one thing you want me to focus on? Or is there one thing you want to speak to me about? Or one thing you want to show me? One decision maybe I need to make. Because all through the Bible, it's very plain that there's power in one thing. The Apostle Paul put it probably the best in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, where he said, This one thing I do, I forget the things that are behind me, and I reach forward to the things that are in front of me. You say, well, that sounds like two things, forget and reach. No, you can't reach if you still haven't forgotten. It starts with the one thing of forgetting. And Satan is so good at paralyzing people by their past uh, that they can't see that God might have something great for them in their future because they're so focused on that. I told you I've been preaching in, in Genesis and some of the great stories in there, one of my favorite ones in there, and I'll end with it today, is the same guy, Jacob, that I talked about that became Israel, became the father of the nation of Israel, that had the dream at Bethel where he saw the ladder and the angels of God going up and down. <clears throat> well, the reason he had that dream is because he was on a journey. What had happened was his name was Jacob, which basically meant deceiver, and he had been deceiving all his life. He had a brother named Esau, and he deceived his brother more than once, but the story that I focus on here right now is when his father Isaac got old and was going to speak blessing over them before, <clears throat> before he was gone, which was very customary, he deceived his father and he, he took the older brother's blessing. And the reason that's important, in Bible days, inheritance was distributed this way. The firstborn got a double portion of all the rest of them. For example, if you had three kids and you had $400,000, the oldest would get $200,000 and the next two each got $100,000. You say, that doesn't seem fair. I get it. I understand. But that's what they did back then. So basically what he did was he got the 200 and, and his brother got cheated and just got 100. Brother Esau, 
The Bible tells us Esau was ticked off. How many can relate to Esau? He was ticked off. And so here's what he said. He said, when my father, when the morning's over, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill my brother. Now, the Bible says Esau was a skilled hunter. He was good at tracking and killing. Everybody say tracking and killing. And he said, I'm going to kill him. If your brother's good at ping pong and says, I'm going to kill you, that probably doesn't make you too nervous. But if your brother is good at tracking and killing and says, I'm going to kill you, make you do what Jacob did. He ran to mama and said, what should I do? And she said, get out of Dodge, son. Here's what she told him to do. They lived in the very southern part of Israel. They lived in the valley. And she said, go to Great Falls, Minnesota, or somewhere like that. Go, go way up there to the very border. Get up there. In fact, she said, go to Haran, which was just over the northern border. Go into southern Canada. Get out of here. And so when he had that dream, you know how much he traveled in one day? 20 miles. And he got to a spot where there were some springs, and that's why he was sleeping there, and he had this dream. And God was showing him he was still going to be with him in spite of the fact he was a flawed individual. And so he gets to Haran. When he gets there, he don't know anybody, but Mama has said, I got relatives there. I got some kinfolks there. You might get a wife there. He said, eh, okay, I'll go. He shows up at a well, and here comes this girl named Rachel, and she is one good-looking girl. You say, how you know? The Bible says she was. The Bible says she was beautiful and comely of form. I'm going to put it plain. Good shape, beautiful. <laughs> got his attention. She was hot. I know hot melts, but right then she was hot. He's attracted to her. She takes him home. Lo and behold... Her dad's brother of my mom. Come and live with us. He comes in. He's taken care of. Again, he's a stranger. And he says to Laban, man, that girl of yours, I'd love to marry her. He said, well, so son, I'll tell you what, you can have her. You can marry her. All you got to do is work for me for seven years and you can marry her. How much glad they quit some of this Bible stuff way back a long time ago? <laughs> seven years and you can have her. The Bible says, Jacob said, okay, I love her, man. And he worked for him seven years. And then he's supposed to be given her as, as wife. Well, they get married, and he looks the next morning, and I, don't ask me to explain this one. Pastor John will explain it. He's smarter than me, but the Bible says he looks the next morning, and behold, he had not been given Rachel, but her older sister Leah. Now, here's all the Bible says about Leah. She was tender-eyed or weak-eyed. I don't know what that means, but it means basically you will never be on the cover of Vogue magazine is basically what it means. <laughs> now, stay with me because I, I understand real beauty is on the inside, not on the outside. We all know that, Okay. But he, he hadn't paid much attention to her. And so, he, think of Leah. You know, she's married him, and that's the morning after, and your husband rolls over and looks at her and goes, Ah, what are you doing here? And jumps up and runs out the door. I mean, how would that make you feel? And he runs, this is all in the Bible. Y'all think I'm talking about Jerry Springer or something. This is in the Bible, folks, so I'm telling you. And so, goes to Laban, you lied to me. You said seven years, you give me Rachel. You know I'm in love with Rachel. He said, no, son. Let's calm down here. Calm down here. So we have a custom in our land that the younger daughter can't ever get married until the older one's married. And her older sister, she ain't got a husband. So she's got to have a husband before the younger one can have. That's just our custom here. Well, why didn't you tell me that seven years ago? Because you would have found the fastest camel I had, and you'd have been gone out of here with Rachel. That's why I didn't tell you that. But, but he said, I'm such a good guy, I'll make you a bargain. You give me another seven years, you can have them both. How's that? He said, I'm such a good guy. In fact, I won't make you wait seven years this time. It's in the Bible. Just fulfill her week seven days, and in seven days I'll give you a Rachel, and you can have two wives and work for, me, work for me, the big lie and cheat, for another seven years. How's that for you? And that's what he did. And so the Bible goes on and tells us he married Rachel, he married Leah. They had two servant girls, concubines, long story, read it in the Bible. Twelve sons, the tribes of Israel named after them. Now, I wind it up with this. A lot of you are familiar with that story. If you're not, you can read it in basically Genesis 28 to 32. It's a true story. But the saddest part in the story to me is not that Laban was a liar or Jacob was a cheat. It's this girl Leah. That there had to be some type of a conversation like, you know, babe, I know this guy likes your sister, but have you noticed you don't have a husband yet? She you noticed nobody asked you to the prom? She you noticed nobody's asked you for a date? I don't know if you're ever going to get married, honey, but I tell you what, we can trick this old boy. And once he does, he, he's got you. I mean, you got him. They concocted a scheme, and Leah had to go along with the scheme. She had to have such maybe a poor self-image to think that nobody would want me. And she does it. And then you wake up, and he goes, ah, how did that make you feel? Plus, all your life. 
You've heard people talk about, oh, beautiful Rachel. You know, Pastor Ricky talked about children being that way. Adults can be kind of stupid too sometimes, you know, and not be thoughtful about people. This girl lived with this all her life, and now I'm stuck living the rest of my life with a sister that I've suffered under her, been in her shadow all these years, and now we've got to share the same man. But I can tell you that I believe this. She did not let the rejection, the disappointment, the, the things that happened in her past rob her of what God might have had in her future because she's listed today as a mother of the sons of Israel. The highest honor a woman could have in the day was to give birth to a male child. And Jacob had, or Israel, had 12 sons with these four women. But Leah gave birth to as many as all the rest of them put together. And at the end of Jacob's life, many years later, read it in Genesis 49, 31, this beautiful girl, Rachel, yes, he loved her deeply. Also, it was important to people where they were buried. Read it in Genesis 49, 31. He said to his boys, boys, whatever you do, make sure you bury me in the field by Leah. I want my bones to lay beside her bones. That tells me somewhere along the course of life, this girl made a decision. I'm not going to let the pain, bitterness, disappointment, rejection of my past fill me with revenge and vindictiveness. I'm going to forget the things behind me, and I'm going to press toward whatever God has in front of me. And God blessed and made her life fruitful. And my friend, no matter what your past is, no matter how flawed it looks like, there's a God that will do the same thing in your life because there's one God and you're the one he loves. Would you stand with me, please, this morning across the room? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads today, every head bowed, every eye closed. I want to ask you a question. I ask you to think about the one thing. If you're here today and you know you're not in right relationship with Jesus Christ, the one thing you need to do is to open your heart to him. This church can't forgive you. This church can't wash your sins away. There's a God in heaven that sent his only son, Jesus, to die and to pay the penalty for your sins. And he said... If you would confess him as your Lord and Savior, he would forgive you of all your sin and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Every head bowed, every eye closed. How many people today lift your hand to God and say, God, I need that kind of grace in my life. I ask you to forgive me. Raise your hand. Thank you. All over this room, you're saying, that's me. I see your hands, and you're not lifting them to me. You're showing God. You're saying, God, I'm sincere about this, and I believe the sincerity of your heart, or you would not be raising your hand. I don't care how flawed the past. I don't care what it looked like. I don't care what it was. God's here to say, I forgive you as you turn your heart to him. I want to Ask everybody in this room, repeat this prayer out loud with me. Let's join these people, these many that raised their hands. Let's all lift our voice in one chorus and say this together. But if you raised your hand, mean it from your heart and know that God is taking you at your word as you confess Jesus as your Savior. Pray this with me. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for sending your only Son, Jesus, to pay the penalty for the sins of mankind. <clears throat> I have sinned, and I'm sorry. Please forgive me of all my sins. Remove all the guilt and shame. I today, January 27th, confess Jesus Christ as my Savior and as my Lord. This is a new day. Old things have passed away, and I have a fresh new start, a new beginning today with my God. I love you, Lord. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Give God praise today. Thank you for letting me be with you today. I love you. God bless you.